Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. We've already read one chapter. Let's read another. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence, and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, he will, uh, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. Thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Let's stop and pray again. Father, I pray that you would help us to concentrate on your word, that I would decrease, that Christ would increase. I pray that you give us ears to hear, help us to understand these things today. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So we might come to this passage today and ask, what do I care about food offered to idols? I don't have a problem with idolatry. Other people have problems with idolatry. But I don't have a problem with idolatry. I want you to consider what John Calvin famously wrote in his Institutes of the Christian Religion, that the human heart is a perpetual idol factory. In Calvin's 16th century world, the word uh, idol factory was quite literal, and it referred to the the prevalence of the blacksmith workshops where, where figurines were handcrafted to, to venerate either, either pagan gods or in many cases, and still are, used in Roman Catholic worship. In his Institutes, Calvin explains that idols are handcrafted representations of gods, typically in the, in the form of a statue, possibly a picture, and they were specifically created to give an, an invisible deity, or saint maybe, a visible form. He explained that, that idols replace the true, invisible, divine reality with a corrupted, false, visible, physical reality. And so for, for Calvin... Idolatry occurs every time that the truth about God is exchanged for a lie. Because idolatry is the worship of a created reality rather than the creator. Remember the condemnation of Romans chapter 1, verse 25. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Paul writes. And so Calvin has harsh words against idolatry. He said this. <clears throat> he said, so it goes. Man's mind, full as it is of pride and boldness, dares to imagine a God according to its own capacity. As it sluggishly plods, indeed is overwhelmed with the crassest ignorance, it conceives an unreality and an empty appearance as God. 
to these evils, a new wickedness joins itself that man tries to express in his work, his craftsmanship, the sort of God that he has inwardly conceived out of his own imagination. Therefore, the mind begets an idol, and the hand gives it birth, he says. He goes on to remind us, he says, the example of the Israelites show the origin of idolatry to be that men do not believe God is with them unless he shows himself physically present. We know not, they said, what has become of this Moses. Make us gods who may go before us. Exodus chapter 32. They knew indeed that this was God whose power they had experienced in a very many miracles. But they could not and did not trust that he was near them unless they could discern with their eyes a physical symbol of his countenance. Which for them would be a, a testimony, Calvin says, of the ruling God. Therefore they wished to recognize from an image going before them that God was the leader of their march. Daily experience teaches that flesh is always uneasy until it has obtained some figment like itself in which it may fondly find solace as an image of God. In almost every age since the beginning of the world, men, in order that they might obey this blind desire, have set up symbols in which they believed God appeared before their bodily eyes. Calvin was saying, it's been the common history of mankind to fabricate images of deity in order to find comfort and solace amidst the troubles of life. This is true. <laughs> we see it throughout the Old Testament as, as the people of Israel continue to follow the nations around that we just read of King Solomon, who put his trust in the gods of his many wives, of the nations around him. They put idols in the high places. They put idols in the places of worship. It even happened, it even happened at Mount Sinai with the golden calf. While Moses was on the mountain receiving God's law, the people were at the foot of the mountain demanding an idol. Remember, the law that Moses was receiving on the mountain, that he received from the Lord, it began with these two commands. The law begins like this, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Our Lord takes idolatry very seriously. My guess is that none of the Christians in this room would argue with that. We understand that God takes idolatry seriously. But let me go back to that opening question again as we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8. What do we care about food sacri <laughs> excuse me, sacrifice to idols? What do we care as modern Americans about food sacrificed to idols? Well, I would submit to you this morning that the application of this chapter isn't as narrow as that. In fact, this chapter is more about knowledge and love for the brethren, love for God and love for the brethren, than it is about food. So let me give you two cautions and a cross-reference that I want you to keep in mind as we consider these things, okay? So caution number one is this. As you read a passage like 1 Corinthians chapter 8, we need to check our own hearts for what some have called geographical snobbery. There are many Christians around the world, even, even in the year of our Lord 2022, who still face this literally. In fact, I would argue that there are probably more that face it than don't. 
new Christians coming from a place like India, for example, are going to struggle with eating beef. And while we know that beef is delicious, we need to be cautious not to flaunt our freedom in the faces of our new brothers and sisters in Christ, but rather to love them and teach them the truth of Jesus Christ. And whether, they, whether or not they ever eat a hamburger actually doesn't matter, right? We understand this. So caution number one is beware of um, geographical snobbery, thinking that we're better than ourselves. This doesn't apply to me. Caution number two is this. We also need to check our own hearts and our own motivations regarding uh, what we might call historical elitism. One commentary put it like this. The questions and solutions of the past are a treasury of wisdom. Only the most arrogant thinkers believe that nothing can be learned from different historical contexts. Once the Christian admits that he is not inherently more intelligent than the people from other places and other times, he will be able to start reading the text with humility. And so I would encourage you to read and to listen to this passage today with humility. Bearing in mind the words of John the Apostle. Here's the cross reference. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. We are to love one another. So keep those two cautions and a cross-reference in mind as we walk through this. <laughs> and the other thing that we should think about as we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8 is that any, any discussion of food sacrifice to idols, it should include, and maybe even should begin with, the, the ruling issued by the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15. If you remember... The question facing the early church was this. Let me read the first two verses. Acts 15, verses 1 and 2 says this. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, quote, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. They were saying, there were those who had come and said that in order to become a Christian, you must first convert to Judaism. You must follow the Jewish religious customs, starting with circumcision. And Paul and Barnabas had a lot to say about that. So after a lot of debate in Jerusalem, and you can read through Acts chapter 15, the, the council, the elders, the apostles, those who had assembled there, they issued a ruling striking down that demand for Gentiles to be circumcised, and they wrote this to the Gentile churches. This is what they wrote. This is from verses 28 and 29 of Acts 15. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well, farewell. Do you also remember that in Revelation chapter 2, Jesus speaks to the several churches and for two churches, specifically the churches of Pergamum and Thyatira, he rebukes them. And let me just read one of the rebukes, Revelation 2.20. He says essentially the same thing to both churches. I'll just read one of them. Revelation 2.20 says he's rebuking them. This is Jesus. For teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food offered to idols. That's what Jesus rebukes these churches for. There's a connection here. I'm sure if you've been with us for the past weeks, as we've walked through 1 Corinthians, if you're familiar with the book at all, you probably haven't forgotten that we have spent, 
I don't know, several weeks now looking at chapters five, <coughs> excuse me, five, six, and seven, which have sexual immorality as the undercurrent to Paul's rebukes and instructions to the church. Now, beginning here in chapter eight, and really continuing really all the way into chapter 11, the undercurrent or the subtext is about food offered to idols. That is, until he starts to address um, the true use of food in worship in chapter 11, the Lord's Supper. But for now, we need to remember that there is clearly a connection in both the Old and the New Testaments between immorality and idolatry. And at its core, it has to do with selfishness and unrestrained appetites. And then beyond that, this text today, these, this chapter, it asks a key question that um, concerns us as Christians and as church members. It essentially is asking this question. <clears throat> How should members of a, of a gospel-shaped community, of a community that is striving to look like Jesus, how should we exercise our Christian liberties and privileges? How should we do that? So I would submit to you, if you haven't picked this up yet, that this chapter is not about food. Rather, as Paul states right here at the beginning, it is about knowledge and love. Knowledge and love. Look again at verses 1 to 3. Now, concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. As Paul transitions from their their previous question of, of marriage relations that they had asked in, really in chapter 7, verse 1. He transitions to this question, and he immediately turns their argument on its head, while at the same time actually agreeing with them. Now, we have to remember that, that these are Christians, and so they, the people of the church of Corinth are, are not that unlike us. They have genuinely put their faith in Christ for salvation. And they have come out of the world and assembled together as the church. They, they've sought to, to distance themselves from the surrounding culture of pervasive idolatry. Yet also, like us, they're still living in the midst of that. And its influence is strong. Now, Food offered to idols. He says, now concerning food offered to idols. That's actually one word. And it, it almost always, when, he, when we think of food offered to idols, it almost always means meat. Most of the meat available on the open market um, would have been slaughtered in one religious setting or another. It might have been different out in the countryside. Where people were raising their own Food, But in the city, in the city of Corinth, they would have gone to market each day. They didn't have refrigeration, remember. They would have gone each day to bring home dinner. And so for new Christians especially, most of the food, particularly the meat, that they would go out to buy would have come with this kind of religious baggage. It would have been butchered in the temple. And then they would send it to the market. So think of it like this. Let me give you a scenario. A Corinthian couple attend church one Sunday. They hear the gospel and are saved. That afternoon or that evening, they're baptized and added to the church. They spend the entire evening eagerly learning about their new Savior. Monday morning as the husband heads to work, his wife walks down to the market to buy the evening meal for the family, same as she's done every other day. The difference is that the last time that she did this, she participated in, in some sort of religious ritual ceremony, maybe even offering up prayers to the animal or the God behind the animal before bringing it home. But now she has a new God. Now she has a new Savior. 
And so now as she walks into this market, or maybe even into the temple where they were selling the meat, she's disgusted. She's disgusted at what it represents. She's disgusted at, at, that she used to be a part of that lifestyle, and she wants nothing to do with it. But rather, she wants only to worship her God and glorify in her new Savior who has delivered her from all of this. She's determined to put her sin to death and to walk in the way of Christ. But she also knows that she needs to feed her family. This is the only food available. Can Christians eat this? I remember when her, when her husband would go to the temple, before he had trusted in Christ, he would visit with the temple prostitutes. Do you see why this would be a problem for new believers? Paul immediately gets to the heart of the matter by quoting the Corinthians back to them. Evidently, when they had written to him, they had said, all of us possess knowledge. And this knowledge that they're claiming, and that Paul is agreeing that they possess, is likely what he says in verse 4, which is essentially this, idols aren't real gods, and, and there is no God but one. Look at verse 4. He's agreeing with them. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that, quote, an idol has no real existence. And that, quote, there is no God but one. He's agreeing with them. And even though he agrees that this is true, we know, he says both in verse 1 and verse 4, even though he affirms that it's true, he warns them that this knowledge puffs up. It's making them proud. Now, now sometimes people take this phrase, knowledge puffs up, and they use it as an excuse to be lazy in their Bible study. They will use it as an insult sometimes against people who actually know what the Bible says and means. This is one of those phrases that's just like the phrase, um, thou shalt not judge. It's one of those phrases that a lot of people have memorized and have no idea what they mean. But Paul is not saying here that knowledge is bad. He's saying that a knowledge of God without a love for God puffs people up with pride. And the perfect example of this is, is the Pharisees, of which Paul used to be the chief of Pharisees, he calls himself. Just listen to one interaction. This is from John chapter 9, where the Pharisees confront a man that Jesus had healed from blindness. I want you to see an illustration of this um, knowledge that is puffed up. I'm going to read John chapter 9, verses 24 to, to 34. It says this, and listen to the, listen to the pride of the Pharisees. John 9, 24 says, So for the second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. They're speaking of Jesus. We know that this man, Jesus, is a sinner. He answered, Whether he's a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I've told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, Jesus, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. <coughs> Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And they answered him, you were born in utter sin and you would teach us? They cast him out. And that is knowledge that puffs up. That is a knowledge that has led to a spiritual pride. And it's a knowledge that is utterly devoid of love. Uh, love for God or love for their neighbor, for, for that man. Paul is saying here, <coughs> 
Paul is saying here that knowledge without love is completely barren. Look at verse 2 again. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. Even God's law tells us this. Consider Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. This is the Shema. I'm going to come back to this again in a minute. But Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5 says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And do you see it in verse 3? Look at verse 3 again. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. The proud, the puffed up, like the Pharisees, they knew God, but they were not known by him. Not in the sense that Paul is talking about anyway. Consider uh, another obscure passage. Nahum chapter 1 verse 7 says this, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. He knows those who take refuge in him. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 19, But God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal, the Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. The Lord knows those who are his. Knowledge of God isn't enough. We must love him. And if we love him, we are known by him. Paul will expand on that more in, in chapter 13, the famous 1 Corinthians chapter 13, love chapter. Paul will exp expand on it more, but for now, he's going to answer their question and he's going to connect knowledge, love, and food, or really idolatry, as he speaks of, of many gods and many lords. Look at this next section, gods and lords, verse 4. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. Again, Paul here goes back to their quotes, verse 4, and he clearly agrees. We know that this is true. But the Corinthians have written him a question that they want him to address. And so there are disputes within the church over this specific issue. And, and remember, the, the tone of this chapter, it, it really of the previous chapters or the whole book essentially, is corrective. He's correcting them. He's rebuking and instructing them. Their argument, and, and just make sure you understand this, we're talking about the mature Christian's of Corinth, or at least those who have been believers for a while, and they have a handle on the scriptures. Their argument is this. We know that these so-called gods and lords don't exist, and so this food is just fine. And verse 10, verse 10 even tells us that they're evidently eating it in the temple or going into the pagan temples to get the meat. They're flaunting their freedom because they know there is only one God. Paul is agreeing with them that in this fact, there is only one God. And then verse 6 states what, what really can only be a, an early Christian creed. Did you see that in verse 6? Listen to just verse 6 again. Yet for us there is only one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. Paul is saying, here's what Christians believe. And then he takes the opening line from the Shema, Deuteronomy 6.4, I read it just a minute ago. He takes the opening line, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. The Lord is one. And he reformulates that to include Jesus Christ. So here's what we believe about the Father. He is the source and goal of everything. Romans 11 verse 36 says, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Consider 
Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 6, where Moses kind of fights off idolatry, the idolatry of the people of, of Israel by, by saying to them, is he not your father who created you, who made you and established you? Part of the way, part of the way in which God's people, we, part of the way in which we will battle against the idol factories of our hearts is by remembering that the one true God brought all things into being and also uniquely brought his people into being. And so we call him Father. We call him Father. Is he not your Father who created you, who made you and established you? Established you as his people? This is why we read God's word in big chunks when we come together as a church. To remember that he is our father and he has created us. He has made us. He has established us. This is why we read God's word in our own homes and teach it to our children. The Shema goes on to instruct us to do that. We teach it to our children. This is why we sing about him. This is why we hide his word in our hearts to keep us from the temptations to idolatry. The old apostle John, his closing line from that beautiful grandfatherly epistle of love, 1 John, the closing line from 1 John is this. Little children... Keep yourselves from idols. Keep yourselves from idols. But wait, there's more, Paul says. Because the mediator of God's work is the one Lord, Jesus Christ, who is the creator and sustainer of all things. The second half of uh, verse 6 says. Think of Colossians chapter 1. Verses 15 to 17, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things hold together. Do you see what Paul is doing here in 1 Corinthians 8 verse 6? Let me read it again. Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. Paul is telling them, he said that while there are many false gods and false lords, there is but one God and Lord. And in connecting Jesus to, to that to that centerpiece of, of Jewish morning and evening prayers, the, the Shema, Deuteronomy 6. In connecting Jesus to this, he's affirming Jesus' deity. He's affirming Jesus is God and Lord. In him, we live and move and have our being. So far, Paul hasn't really said anything that the Corinthians would take issue with. Especially if they're like us and they think that, well, he must mean somebody else when he says knowledge puffs up. But now he clearly turns the argument on them and he reminds them of their brothers. Pick it up in verse 7. Let me read this paragraph. However, he says, not all possess this knowledge. But some, through former associations with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Food would not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged, if his conscience is weak, to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. Thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes you, my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. However, Paul says, he starts this uh, section by saying, some... 
these former pagans who have recently converted, some do not understand the knowledge of verses 4 to 6. They haven't put all of that together yet. They haven't understood that, that false gods actually don't exist. They haven't understood that false lords actually don't exist. There is one God, one Lord. <coughs> Paul is saying that the Corinthians, those who've been Christians for a while now, they should not have the mindset that they can just eat food offered to idols without any other considerations. There are some new believers who don't understand that, as Charles Bridges puts it in his commentary, the gods of the heathen are imaginary beings. The mature or the knowledgeable Christian understands that these false gods are nothing. Think of Elijah mocking the prophets of Baal in 1 Kings 18. Think of Elijah. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose for yourselves one bowl and prepare it first, for you are many. And call upon the name of your God, but put no fire to it. And they took the bull that was given them, and they prepared it and called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O oh, Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered. And they limped around the altar and, uh, that they had, ma <laughs> had made. And at noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he's musing or he's relieving himself. He's gone on a journey. Perhaps he's asleep and must be awakened. Elijah knew that there was nobody that was going to answer that call because there was nobody there. And so he says, louder. You'll wake up nobody. And now think of that newly saved couple in that scenario that I mentioned earlier. They want to flee from their old life of sin. And they want to live a holy life to God. And as the husband arrives home from a busy day of work, he sits down to a few vegetables that she has prepared. A bowl of broth, maybe. On his way home, he saw that that older couple from church, they were in the pagan temple enjoying a delicious roast. He used to eat like that. Then he would go visit with the temple prostitute. These recent converts have been under the power of the evil one until just recently. And while they have trusted in Christ for salvation, they're still weak of conscience. What does that mean, weak of conscience? What does it mean to have a weak and defiled conscience, as Paul says here? It means that they're in danger. They're in danger of, of either becoming legalists or syncretists. That means that they're either laying rules on their salvation. Eat this, don't eat that. Good Christians do not go anywhere near that temple. You cannot eat that meat. It was offered to those false gods. Christians do not do that. Or they're, they're in danger of synchronizing their old life with their new life, of, of taking their old religious practices and just sort of bringing them into Christianity. Are you, as Christians, are we either are we as Christians either superior or inferior before God based on the food that we eat? Are we superior to others because we eat this or that or don't eat this or that? Not according to verse 8. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. As Christians, we are called to help the brethren, to carry them along and teach them to observe all of Christ's commands. That's part of the Great Commission. That means that we need to show them from the Scriptures that some things from their old way of life are sinful and destructive, like the sexual immorality. And that, and that some things from, uh, from their old life are neither right nor wrong, like the food that we eat. And the point here is this. It is possible for those who are theologically correct on this issue, or other issues, 
It is possible that those who are theologically correct on these things, that we can harm a fellow believer whose conscience is weaker, who doesn't understand the truths about God and the scriptures and will be tempted by our flaunting of our freedoms to be pulled right back into their old way of life. Verse 12 is that dire warning. Thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. When Jesus confronted Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus, do you remember what he said? He said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Or consider the Gospel of Matthew. And the king will answer them, truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Are you willing to lay down your rights as a free Christian in order to, in order to build up your brothers and sisters in Christ? Are you willing to lay down your rights as a free Christian in order to build up your brothers and sisters in Christ. Ultimately, this passage is a rebuke of our own selfishness, and it should cause us to look directly at the cross. I'm going to make a straight line connection from this passage to the cross. It, this should cause us to take these words to heart. Okay? Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. By this... All people will know you are my disciples, Jesus says, if you have love for one another. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that he sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. That's our application. 1 John chapter 4. If God so loved us, we ought to also love one another. Pray with me. Lord, as we consider these things, um, help us not to ignore, not to downplay idolatry in our own hearts, in our own society, in our own families. When we make those, we may not make the, the idols, the, the statues, but in our hearts we are putting lots of things before you. We are failing to trust you in lots of things, and we're celebrating in that. We're eating food offered to our uh, lack of faith. Lord, I pray that we would keep our eyes on the cross, that we would love one another because of what you have done for us, that we would love one another because you have first loved us, that we would love you in the way that Christ has loved us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.